Hello and welcome to The Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on this Thursday, the 12th of October 2023. My name is Freddie Gray. I'm the deputy editor of The Spectator and I will be your host today. On the show this week, we will, of course, be covering the biggest news of the moment, which is the war in the Middle East um, that has broken out following Hamas's terror attacks in the Holy Land. I'll be joined by the spectators Douglas Murray and Paul Wood, who have both written articles on the subject in the magazine this week. Next up, we'll turn to Labour's party conference, which happened this week. Uh, I'll be talking to Stuart Roden, who was a conference attendee, about a strange incident that happened outside the conference centre and the Labour Party more broadly. After that, we'll be asking if Labour supporters tend to hold luxury beliefs. Do you hold luxury beliefs? What are luxury beliefs? We'll talk to Matt Goodwin about a phrase that Suella Braverman used in her speech to Tory party conference last week. And lastly, we will talk about social media and children. Is a social media account more damaging to children than a smoking habit? I'll be joined by the Centre for Social Justice's Cara Usher-Smith and The Spectator's very own Mary Wakefield to talk about this very, very important subject. Before we get going, I must thank our sponsors, Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. They are brilliant sponsors and great supporters of this show. Uh, Canaccord are experienced wealth planners and investment managers who offer unwavering support in these challenging times. To find out more, visit CanDoWealth.com. Now, the big story of the week is, of course, the war that is erupting in the Middle East following the terror attacks by Hamas on Israel at the weekend. I'm joined now by Douglas Murray, uh, our columnist, and Paul Wood, a former BBC World Affairs correspondent and a frequent contributor to The Spectator. Um, And uh, I think we'll get into the Middle East question uh, second after with you, Paul, after uh, I talked to Douglas a little bit about his piece in the magazine this week, um, the headline of which is uh, Britain must stand up against those who support Hamas. And uh, sorry to give away the ending, Douglas, but I'm going to do it. Um, uh, you say that you have a challenge for Rishi Sunak, Swella Bradman, Keir Starmer and the rest of them. Uh, don't just say you stand against terror, show it. Uh, don't just say you stand beside Israel, show it. Uh, the, treat these people, by which you mean people in Britain who express support for Hamas, uh, as we did the supporters of ISIS, take their passports, strip their citizenship, forcibly remove them from this country. Um, I think a lot of people are agreeing with you, certainly from the reaction online. There's a lot of anger about what seemed to be celebration uh, celebrations in London about terror. Uh, in the Middle East. Um, However, let me put it to you that it might be trickier than it was with ISIS to uh, identify Hamas supporters because the issue is somewhat muddled by people who support Palestine. And I don't think you're going to propose throwing them out of the country. No. So if I answer your question, if you have open supporters of a terrorist group and Hamas has been a prescribed terrorist entity in the UK for some years now, prescribed in its entirety. If you have some Hamas supporters in the UK. My suggestion is the UK does not either want or need them. It's also not that difficult. We have senior members of Hamas living in the UK, former members of the senior military leadership of Hamas living in the UK. This is the UK's shame. It isn't for the British government or any other government to tell the Israeli government how they should respond to the massacre of their civilians. But I do think it's important to just bear in mind that we can, in countries like Britain, or should, keep our own house in order. I see no reason why Britain should have, for so many years, been a retirement home for members of the revolutionary Islamic government in Tehran, one of whom, as I wrote about in the magazine recently, lives in Harrow. I see no reason why Hamas's backers should live in the UK, and I don't see any reason why their supporters should live in the UK. After Jews have been massacred for being Jews by Hamas in this ISIS-like fashion, treat the, the people who support that as we would the supporters of ISIS. 
And if you can't remove their citizenship and expel them from the UK, at least prosecute them and imprison them under the 2006 Terrorism Act for the glorification of terror. Look at what happened outside the Israeli embassy in London the other night. Uh, crowds of hundreds of people. And again, yes, there is a blurry line here because a lot of people hide behind the idea that they're supporters of the Palestinian people when in fact they're just haters of the Jewish people. But look at the people who turned out the other night before Israel had done anything in terms of retaliation uh, against Hamas. Hundreds and hundreds of people, notably young people, uh, who were outside the Israeli embassy which had to be boarded up and they were screaming their hatred of Israel. Well, what were they doing? Were they preemptively opposing an Israeli backlash? No, of course not. They were rejoicing in the massacre of Israeli citizens. And as I say in the piece, this has erupted all across Britain. We have people in Brighton talking about how beautiful the massacre of Jews is in Israel and being applauded by crowds. We see in other countries, other democracies, the same, the same way in which people have used our system and taken rights they would never give us in return. What about the people in Sydney, outside the Sydney Opera House, again, after the massacres, before any retaliation, chanting, gas the Jews in Sydney? Israel has its problems, but we in the Western democracies have ours. And our main one is that we have people in our countries who celebrate terror. And I say, get them all out. Well, I, do, I, I, I understand entirely what you're saying, and I agree with it to a large extent, but I just think there may be a difficult to sort of carry on in this muddling point, there may be different laws that would need to be used here. Um, one would obviously be terror legislation, uh, and Hamas is a, a terrorist, prescribed terrorist group. Um, but the other thing we have to use would be hate laws. Uh, and I think there you get into difficult territory. Well, hate laws um, are I mean, all weak. You know, I don't particularly saying believe in hate things. laws. I don't particularly believe in hate laws. I think hate laws are sort of watery thing that that lax and um, soupy governments imposed because they couldn't just impose the rule of law as it existed. Um, so I'm, I'm not very interested in, in hate laws. I am interested in the glorification of terror and the, and, the, and the proposition that people should be allowed to support terrorism in your country. L let me put it this way. Um, on the, let, let's take something like an extremely rare but awful thing like, for instance, the Christchurch mosque massacre some years ago in New Zealand. Imagine if after that massacre, um, there had been a protest outside the embassies of New Zealand around the world of people celebrating the lone wolf gunman who went and shot, shot up that mosque. Would we be see, saying, well, they're just expressing a sort of, you know, uh, a, a right to free expression um, or, or maybe they're objecting to the New Zealand government's potential to have a backlash against... It. No, we would say quite rightly, well, these people are obviously glorifying the terrorists. We all know that it would happen if it was that way round. We all know that. So why is it that the Jewish people have to be the one people in the world who are expected to be massacred and to have to respond with equanimity towards that. And when they're taunted on the streets of London and other capital cities across Europe are meant to just sit back, back and accept it. We didn't take that view with ISIS. We didn't take it with Al-Qaeda. We shouldn't take it with Hamas. Uh, another uh, debate that's sort of springing up uh, on the domestic reaction here in Britain uh, is this issue of projecting uh, Israeli flags onto British government buildings or, or flying Israeli flags from British government public buildings. I wonder how you feel about that. I note that the uh, Muslim Council of uh, Mosques in London has written to the government um, expressing its horror at that, which I suppose is only to be expected. But I think a lot of people feel, and perhaps they're right, that uh, public buildings shouldn't be used for the flying of any flag other than the British flag. Oh, well, here's the thing, though, isn't it? After the, after the Bataclan massacres in France, it was almost de rigueur for people to say, uh, to, to fly uh, French flags. And thank goodness we did a, a, an attempt to show, a weak attempt, an attempt to show solidarity. Um, in fact, when, when other attacks have happened against across Western democracies, it's become a sort of norm to do that. You may like that or you may not. But here's the thing, why, why, why should it be the case that, I mean, again, hardly surprising when we're talking about the MCB, but why should it be the case sort of lower down the food chain, as it were, 
that people would say, yes, of course we must show solidarity if it's, if it's the French who are massacred by Islamist barbarians. But if it's the Israelis who are massacred by Islamist barbarians, who's to say whether we should fly the flag of the country that suffered? I, I think if you've set the precedent of trying to show unanimity and solidarity with friends to be massacred by barbarians in one country, you should probably do it with the others as well. But as always, there's an Israeli exception. An Israeli exception is that people endlessly think, oh, well, maybe it's going to be divisive. It's only divisive in the UK because we've let in an awful lot of people who support terrorism when it's done by the terrorists of groups like Hamas against the Jewish nation. So, so no, I mean, I think that anyone who, who sort of has a sudden problem with that now should have had it had a bigger problem with it earlier on. And I think the, if they have a problem with it now when it comes to the flag of Israel, it tells us much more about themselves than it does about Israel. Yes. Well, let's let's move on to uh, the question of what's or the questions about what's going on um, in Israel and, and the Holy Land. Um, Paul, I'll come to you. Uh, you've got an excellent, typically excellent piece in this week's magazine uh, in which you speak to various people who do know a lot about this. Uh, and the big question that everyone, everyone started asking as soon as this happened was the involvement of Iran, the extent of Iranian involvement. Can you tell us a little bit about what you were able to discover? We should say, first of all, there's no proof of Iranian involvement. And in fact, the US uh, the White House in the US says that American intelligence agencies are looking for that proof but haven't found it. So what you have is well-founded supposition. And the well-founded supposition says that Hamas already gets a lot of money from Iran, maybe $100 million a year, is well known to have received technical support from Iran, how to build bombs from everyday materials like pipes and fertilizer and sugar. And also there have been a lot of meetings between senior Hamas figures and senior figures from the Iranian Quds Force, which directs Iranian foreign policy. So Joel Rayburn, who used to run Iran policy on the US National Security Council, who's quite a legendary figure in the Middle East to people who follow these events, says that to his mind, there's absolutely no doubt that Iran was behind this because the Quds Force, when it has a client like Hamas, almost without exception, uh, directs that client uh, for any major initiative, uh, tells that client like Hamas how it will be done, when it will be done. And in Rayburn's view, this was done for Iranian strategic region, reasons, uh, not Hamas strategic reasons. And those reasons would be that Iran doesn't yet have a nuclear weapon, uh, needs to uh, cripple Israel, and by extension the US, needs to support Hezbollah, its militia in Lebanon to the north, and therefore wants to tie Israel down using Hamas. And rather worryingly, his view is that uh, this also means that the Iranians will activate Hezbollah to attack Israel if it looks like Hamas will be destroyed and therefore Hezbollah will be isolated. That for Iran is a strategic imperative. All of that does make perfect sense, but there is as yet no proof of it. Um, another interesting point that comes out of your piece uh, is uh, one Hamas figure uh, suggesting, uh, almost sort of accidentally suggesting, but suggesting that uh, the attack was not entirely in their control. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about that? This is Osama Hamdan, who's a very senior member of Hamas, a member of their Politburo, who I must say seemed almost taken aback by what had happened and scrambling to catch up. And you can imagine that this was something kept very close to the military wing of Hamas in its planning, and then spokesmen and politicians like him have to run to catch up and justify it. Uh, I get a stream of Hamas press releases on my phone, the latest of which says that there were no atrocities. This is the Western media making things up. This is the Israelis making things up. These, of course, are absurd lies. There was mass murder. Um, it's been well documented. And yet Hamas seeks to deny it. Um, in his view, this was a military operation uh, against military targets. And as he told me, the Israelis are playing up the civilian casualties because they are embarrassed about the extent to which there was a total collapse of their army around Gaza. And there was, in fact, a collapse. It was 12 hours, 24 hours before um, some of the Israeli towns, kibbutzes that were under attack uh, got help from the army. Um, he's pointed out um, some videos such as a Hamas fighter apparently asking permission to take food from an Israeli house. Uh, a Hamas fighter apparently telling a woman and her two children, we are Muslim, we will not hurt you. Again, the, uh, the Hamas media machine is pushing out those videos this morning. 
Um, but ultimately, and this is the justica justification you get from, from people I've been phoning all around the region, um, we've been killed. Uh, there's a double standard here. Palestinians are being constantly killed. And when we hit back, uh, everybody sympathizes with Israel. What about the Palestinian dead? Uh, he also said something very interesting um, about uh, Hamas being forced into doing this because of the rapid pace of settlement in the West Bank, which in his view made the possibility um, of a Palestinian state too remote ever to be achievable. And he almost felt this was the last chance to do something about that. Now, to those who, who disbelieve that particular argument, I also had a very similar argument from a former head of Mossad, the Israeli spy agency, Danny Yatom, who said, look, Netanyahu had a Machiavellian policy of cynically building up Hamas in order to weaken the PLO, which is the main interlocutor uh, with Israel. There are no talks with Hamas, there are talks with the PLO. Netanyahu wanted to cripple the possibility of a Palestinian state and gambled and made a terrible mistake in building up Hamas in order to do that. Douglas, I wanted to ask you about uh, Israel making terrible mistakes. Uh, I mean, you put in your piece, uh, the Israelis will respond as they see fit. It isn't for non-Israelis to give them advice. Uh, and I, I see that point. Um, but also, if we feel Israel, our ally, may be making a great mistake uh, in its response, may even be falling into a trap, possibly even an Iranian set trap, uh, is there not some uh, validity to the argument that by uh, reacting as violently as, as they seem to be reacting, uh, they are only, uh, you know, people talk about uh, mowing the, the grass in, in Gaza, um, they're only creating the conditions for it, to, for it to grow back even more ugly? Well, first of all, I don't agree with the proposition that Israel has done anything significant or anything significantly bloody to date. And I can certainly say with absolute certainty uh, that no Israeli soldier has yet gone in and mass gang raped and then uh, uh, stabbed and beheaded uh, women in the Gaza. We're not dealing with the endless issue. Of the, it's a particularly British fetish, this. It's weird a fetish about proportionality in conflict. If there was proportionality in conflict, then it would seem that we would have to allow the Israelis to go and gang rape and behead uh, the same number of women and children as the, as the so-called fighters and militants, the terrorists of Hamas, did in Israel. So Israel hasn't responded with 1% of the barbarism that was shown on Israeli territory last Saturday, not a bit of it. What Israel does have to do is to reassert its own um, impenetrability, its own um, impermeability. And that is what one of the many things that suffered such a blow at the weekend. The, the uh, belief that Israeli intelligence is all-knowing took a huge hit. The idea that the IDF is endlessly able to defend the Israeli people against all enemies took a massive hit. The idea that tech uh, can, can stand in for human beings at border crossings and so on took a huge hit. The technological prowess and much more has taken a huge hit. So the most important thing I should think that Israel would need to do is to, is to build those uh, things, even if they are myths, back up. Uh, and it should be allowed to do so. Uh, that might well include doing things which uh, um, people sitting comfortably in other Western democracies think they oughtn't to do. But I would have thought that if, and again, by proportion of population, if some tens of thousands of British people were massacred at the weekend at a music festival and house to house in small towns uh, in a part of our country, I think we would be quite tired of people who said they were friends saying to us, now don't overreact, chaps, will you? Don't do anything bad. Hold it. I mean, there's something so insulting about the way in which people think, as I said earlier, that the, 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 the one Jewish nation in the world is the one nation that is expected to just suck, suck, suck such things up. William Hague did it in the Times the other day. Don't fall for this trap, chaps. Um, well, there are lots of things that Israel could do. Uh, and uh, I, I will, it'll be very interesting in the weeks ahead whether people remember the initial atrocities that will have caused the war to come and keep them in mind, or whether those same people end up being the people 
who, particularly in Britain, always end up saying, oh, proportionality. We showed no proportionality in conflicts we've had in the UK in the past, and when, whenever Britain has been attacked. What do you think it meant in the Second World War when people sent home postcards saying, we didn't take many prisoners today? So, no, the endless urging of restraint on Israel is an endless urging that the international community does because Israel is the only country in the world never allowed to win a war. That's why, by the way, you have the situation in the Gaza. You have all the international idiots telling the Israelis they have to withdraw. And then what happens? You give the Palestinians a statelet and they, they give you Hamas and war. Uh, anyone who thinks the West Bank is going to be a Palestinian state is now living with the fairies. And it's not because of the Israelis. It's because the Palestinian Authority hasn't wished to create a state for decades. It never did. It's only ever been interested in creating a state from the river to the sea, as they always say. It's never been interested in a two-state solution. The Palestinian Authority, under two leaders now, has repeatedly turned down every Israeli offer uh, of, of peace. They were offered 99% of what they wanted just 15 years ago. They turned it down again, as Yasser Arafat did at Oslo. They don't want a two-state solution. They want a one-state solution, and that's a Jewish-cleared Palestinian state. Paul, I wonder what you make of Douglas's point there. I think the two-state solution is probably dead, which is a pity because it's the only solution which makes sense in the long run. Um, Israel, I think, has begun intense bombing already and will have to go in on the ground, having destroyed the obvious targets. Hamas is this amalgam of both a state with government buildings to bomb and a guerrilla force, and the guerrillas have now withdrawn into the civilian population, uh, which is being hit by Israel. Now, what Hamas did um, was a war crime, um, murders were committed. This is against international law. But Israel is a state which at least pretends to be governed by international law. And this is one of the suggestions which came out in the, in the horrible 24 hours of chaos and confusion um, when this happened at the weekend was a former Israeli general called Giora Island, who was the southern commander, used to be in charge of Gaza, saying that what we should do is go in and literally poison the wells. 97% of Gaza's water comes from these saltwater wells and it has to be purified in water purification plants. Um, Giora Island, General Island, wanted to um, destroy those purification plants saying, everybody will say we're deliberately causing a humanitarian disaster and we will be doing that as a means to get our hostages back and destroy Hamas. Well, that would almost certainly be a breach of international law. It would be collective punishment. And this perhaps is the kind of trap which Hamas, whether knowingly or unknowingly, because Iran pushed them to do this, has set for Israel. A lot of Israeli strategists and people who thought about this don't want a reoccupation of the Gaza Strip. They know that that way lies more misery and more bloodshed. And by the way, in the end, Israel is going to have to talk to Hamas and prob probably is talking to them already through intermediaries about the hostages, talking through Qatar. Um, there is the outlines of a settlement there. It's still the two-state solution, impossible as that seems now. It's even one which so-called moderates in Hamas, and this is an organization with moderates and hardliners like any other, it's a solution that some in Hamas do want eventually, despite the atrocities at the weekend. I, I think, I'm sorry to disagree with Paul, but I greatly respect, but I think, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's nonsense to so let's think there's any such thing as a two-state solution on the table. I don't think it has been. I think that it's been the sort of thing that uh, a certain type of Western politician who, who, who hasn't been following it very closely thinks always is the perpetual answer. The truth is, is that nobody wants the Palestinian people. The Arab uh, nations don't want them. If the Jordanians cared about the Palestinian people, they would have taken them in uh, 50 years ago. If the Egyptians cared about the Palestinian people, they'd have taken them in from the Gaza many years ago. The Egyptians don't like them. The Jordanians don't want them. None of the other countries in the region want them. But it's very convenient for them to all make the Palestinians Israel's problem. I see no reason why the Palestinian peoples have to be Israel's problem. Uh, as I say, the Israeli uh, people have learned a very unpleasant lesson in the last 17 years now, that if you give the Palestinians territory, they will give you rockets in return. And you can always find people uh, uh, like the general you just cited in the immediate aftermath of unspeakable atrocities of the kind not seen since World War II. You can always find somebody who, who, who will voice a, a particular a vengeful opinion. But that's because there's vengeance in the air because an atrocity was committed. And again, if this had been done against the British public, 
if this had been an attack on Britain, I'd have thought we'd find a lot of vengeful people here. At least I'd hope so. I, I think that's quite right, Douglas. I take that point. But I suppose the difference is uh, Britain isn't Israel. Uh, and we are not surrounded by countries that wish to um, annihilate us. Uh, and so therefore, Israel's response, uh, you know, a, a, a wise, wise counsel might be uh, not to respond uh, in, in the retaliatory way that oh, a lot of but, Israeli but politicians not, are now suggesting. Not to respond at all. I mean, for instance, why should Qatar be, be, be hosting the heads of Hamas? Why should Qatar not be held responsible? Uh, one reason, I'll tell you right away, is that Qatar has managed to buy up a whole load of influence in countries like this one. Nobody will talk about that what should happen, which is, among other things, retaliatory strikes against Hamas leaders who live in Qatar. But, of course, Britain won't do that because Britain's been compromised, like so many countries. So, I mean, a lot of British uh, politicians and others will say, oh, don't do anything that rocks the boat, Israel. And among other things, what they mean is, We've lost control of things, including our parts of our financial system. We can't control the British streets. So don't you in Israel do anything that makes a mess of our streets? Well, again, that's not Israel's problem. That's ours. It's us who've been the idiots. Paul, uh, Douglas says uh, nobody really wants a Palestinian state. Do you think the European Union wants a Palestinian state? It's thrown uh, billions in support uh, to Palestine. Uh, probably. I, I mean, this is, in one sense, Douglas is right. There is no two-state solution for the foreseeable future. But in another sense, it's the only game in town. And uh, for instance, Danny Atom, the former Mossad chief, said that with 500,000 settlers now in the West Bank and more being pushed in by the Netanyahu government, that was an attempt to make the two-state solution impossible. No doubt the Palestinians um, or the PLO, as Indra, Israel's main negotiating partner, carries a lot of blame for that too. But in Yatom's view, um, this was uh, Netanyahu carrying out a long-standing policy of some Israeli governments to try to annex the West Bank. And the response from Hamas, um, the bloody massacre that we saw last weekend, in the words of the Hamas spokesman um, who talked to me about it, was they felt they, they were being backed into a corner. Um, that's their calculation. Um, it's the innocent people who, who suffer in this. Um, Palestinian children bleed too. On the first day of Israel's bombing, um, a family of 19 who'd fled their home because of a warning shot nearby to another building were in the building when it was hit by a missile. 19 people dead, mostly women and children. Um, according to the AP reporter on the scene, didn't seem to be a military target there. Of course, this is what happens when guerrilla armies, which is what Hamas is, retreat into the civilian population. Of course, this is what happens in the built up slums that constitute most of Gaza City. Uh, it, it may not be um, the aim of Israeli policy, although most in the Arab world will certainly think that it is. One of the dispiriting things in the 24 or 48 hours after the attack was looking at the Arab press and seeing almost no coverage of the Israeli victims. People's hearts were hardened right from the outset. And that's what I got in telephone calls with people. They feel they have their victims that have always been ignored, and now they're ignoring the Jewish victims. It makes you very pessimistic about any outcome. One thing we can say with absolute certainty is uh, that the soldiers of Israel are not going to be hiding among civilian populations and using the populations as shields. That is exactly what Hamas has done. It's exactly what the, fight, the, the fighter terrorists of Hamas have done. It's their plan. So, you know, there's also a, an issue not only of proportionality, but of intentionality. And the intention of Hamas last week was to kill as many innocent people as possible. The intention of Israel very clearly, as has been shown in many engagements, is to kill as few innocent people as possible. That difference might seem academic to some people, but in it lies everything. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about, uh, but sadly we don't have time. Um, so uh, Douglas and Paul, for now, thank you very much for joining Spectator TV. Now, the horrifying events of the Middle East overshadowed the Labour Party conference somewhat this week in Liverpool. However, there was a related incident um, that occurred outside the conference centre, uh, where some pro-Palestinian activists were confronted by uh, a Jewish man who was rather upset at what they were saying. That man was Stuart Roden, who joins us now. Uh, first of all, Stuart, let's look at the clip. Under Starmer is bad. Under Jeremy Corbyn... Stop, 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 stop,
Coward! Disgusting! You came into a country, you murdered children! This is not the time to be doing this! Not in the aftermath of what has happened! What happened 24 hours ago? You can be ashamed of yourself! You can step back! Let this pass! It's disgusting! Are you going to murder individuals? Are you going to murder individuals like you did over the weekend? Stuart, Stuart Roden has very kindly joined us down the line. Um, Stuart, tell us a little bit about what happened uh, outside Labour Party conference there. Of course. So I, 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 I went to the conference to, to hear um, uh, Rachel Reaver's speech. I had to leave early. Um, and I have to say the mood, the mood there was slightly subdued because of um, events uh, in Israel, for sure. And then I come across this demonstration, probably, I don't know, 100, 120 people with Palestinian flags and messages. And there was a, a community officer standing there. And I said to him, am I able, am I permitted to have my own counter rally and demonstration? And he said, absolutely, why not? I said, fantastic. So uh, that's exactly what I did. And of course, um, I had to raise my voice because it was you know, what, one against 100, 120. And um, it was very instinctive, obviously not planned. I didn't know it would be there when I, when I walked out. And the guttural feel I had uh, was that this is an incredibly disrespectful, uh, insensitive and insulting thing to be doing at best. They started coming up to me and I saw some of their signs. I realized that actually um, what they were uh, saying and what they were Shouting was actually kind of worse than that. Uh, and um, to do that in the aftermath um, of what had happened over the weekend, uh, kind of the massacre, the butchery, the, the terror that was spread, uh, of which we're finding out obviously more now than we even knew then, uh, was, to was totally inappropriate. And I didn't want to stand by and do nothing. I didn't want to walk past without having uh, said something. So that's that's. That's what happened. Well, the, the video's obviously been seen quite a lot. It's been uh, quite a story. Um, I was wondering if you've had any follow-up, if you had any further abuse? Uh, none. Absolutely none. I, I, and what is incredibly heartening is to get messages from people I don't know, uh, from friends of friends, from people of different parts of, uh, of the world. Um, and many, many, not only were they supportive, but they said had they been there, they would have stood next to me. So I've had absolutely uh, uh, no abuse at all, J -j just support. I know you're keen not to get dragged into uh, a big discussion about Labour and anti-Semitism, but it's hard to talk about this without touching on the matter. Um, obviously, the Labour Party of Jeremy Corbyn uh, was quite different or positioned itself very differently to Keir Starmer on this issue. Keir Starmer and other Labour leaders were quite clear in their condemnation of um, Hamas's attacks. Uh, I was just wondering if you know your relationship with the Labour Party has changed as a result of that change. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And there is absolutely no way I would, um, and I voted for different parties over my life. There's absolutely no way I would have uh, voted for Jeremy Corbyn and didn't, and voted actively ag against him. And um, I think um, Keir has done an incredibly good job uh, on that, and it's absolutely clear in my mind that those people um, who were demonstrating would have been inside the hall under the previous regime. Um, and clearly, they're now not allowed. They've been expelled from the party. And um, the, 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 the idea um, that the party hasn't changed is, is, is ludicrous because it, it, it seriously, seriously has. And I think uh, as I say, witness those people outside, uh, not inside. And also, of course, uh, people like Luciana Berger, who was um, left the party and rejoined earlier uh, this year, or other very clear signs of a complete change on this. Um, we've seen various protests uh, all over the world, really, all over the developed world, uh, for Palestine and against Israel, and often with quite an explicitly anti-Jewish message. Uh, I think we saw people singing gas to Jews in Sydney, uh, we've seen people firing fireworks at the uh, Israeli embassy in London. Um, I wonder if you tell us a little bit about 
how that makes you feel, whether, whether you know, was, that, was, it, was it your awareness that, that that was going to be the reaction that led you to, to react to the way you did um, against those Labour protests? Uh, no, the answer is no. As I said, it was, it was an instinctive reaction. Uh, but, but I think there's absolutely no doubt that Hamas regard for Palestinian, uh, the lives of Palestinian children um, and, and women and the weak. Uh, they would have known the response would have been strong. And it is just not something that comes into their calculus. And I'm afraid we are uh, in, a, in a, another clash of civilizations, one that respects life uh, and everything that it stands for. And I tell you that Israel, even if it does have an aggressive response, which it needs to have to protect its borders, which is the first priority of every government, it will do everything in its power, as it always has done, to avoid civilian casualties. That is not the same of the other side. In the Jewish community, clearly there's been a lot of grief and shock because we all have friends and family who uh, live in Israel or know people who do. So it's, it's all very, very connected. And of course, we saw the um, vandalism of a shop, uh, a kosher shop on Sunday morning. We saw, have seen offensive graffiti. We've seen flags taken down. And there is fear. There is real fear. Um, you would have read that a, a Jewish secondary school has told its kids not to wear its blazers for fear of attack. It's stopped detention so kids don't go home late. And people are scared, and we shouldn't be scared uh, living, living in this country. And uh, I thank you know, the police for uh, being there, looking after us. They are protecting us, uh, for sure. I hope matters don't escalate. But where we see, and this is something which I, I will say, I didn't recognize when I did that demonstration, but when you see, see things that say, free, free Palestine, that only means one thing. And it's absolutely fine for people to be critical of Israeli policies. That's fine. But demonization of Israel is modern day anti-Semitism. It used to be religious anti-Semitism. It was then racial. Um, today, anti-Semitism is defined by demonization and delegitimization of Israel. And that's what some of those people were saying and singing. And that's what some of their posters say. And I really do hope, and I've seen what the current Home Secretary has said about this, that she said she will be a tough on that. To me, that is incitement to hatred. Uh, waving a flag, uh, I think, is going to be nuanced, and people are going to have to make their own decisions about it. But it's interesting that the uh, Israeli, uh, the, sorry, the Palestinian ambassador to this country hasn't condemned uh, the Hamas attacks. And I guess this is going to become quite a big issue. But we can't have Jewish people walking around the streets in fear of their own safety in life. And in fact, when I left the demonstration on Monday morning, I was going to walk back to the station and the two police officers said they wanted to escort me. So I got a complete waste of resource. I, I, both, I thanked them for it and I had two plainclothes people, uh, a policeman, escorting me. I'm sure this would not have happened the other way around. There's no way if it was the other way around where it had been a Jewish demonstration and, of course, the Jewish community would never, ever, ever have held a demonstration if there was ever a situation where there had been cold-blooded massacre committed by Israelis or Jewish people. It, it just wouldn't happen. So I hope we, we will be safe. I, I appreciate everything that the, the, um, the government and the police are doing, are doing for us. Uh, but I think these are going to be some pretty uh, tricky times ahead. And what I would say, um, and I've heard this from lots of young people, um, who are either at school or university or the workplace or amongst their friends, if you are uh, thinking about what you should say to someone who is Jewish or Israeli or you know is very committed uh, to, to these issues, it's a bit like when someone dies, don't cross the road, put your arm around them, send them a message, say something, because it, it goes a long, long way. It really goes a long way to know that we're not alone and there are other people in this country and afar who care for us and are grieving with us for the loss that we've just had. David Baddiel, uh, the comedian, uh, says that anti-Semitism is, is the, the last acceptable hatred in Britain or the only acceptable hatred in Britain. Do you, do you, would you go that far? I, 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 I know what he's saying. Uh, I, I agree with his general thrust. It's a long, long uh, discussion. But what I do know is that at times like this, uh, we have faced uh, uh, proper anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism, which uh, can often be violent. So this is not you know, casual. 
Um, and I'm afraid it's organized. You saw that, as you said, what happened outside the Israeli embassy. And people are, you know, we've read it, people went to there to kind of uh, show their support for Israel. And they were basically turned back because of the hostile environment in which they faced. Uh, David's point is a, you know, a, a nuanced one and a deeper one, and you know, I have a lot of sympathy for it. But, but today the issue is, is, our, is our safety. And we've seen these things escalate. I think the number of year on year, when they've looked at the same dates last year, the number of anti-Semitic incidents is up a threefold in three or four days. And I'm afraid uh, that, that, that will continue. Um, and this, you know, remember, this is, these started, these started before there'd been a response, given, you know, the catastrophe that happened in Israel. So this was when they had seen what the carnage was, they were doing that celebration. So clearly, we're now, Israel is going to defend its, its borders, it's going to defend its people, which is the first priority of any a democratically elected government. And unfortunately, there is going to be, you know, collateral damage, which we, we, we are sorry about. We are truly sorry. We don't want that. And so, yes, I do, I do have fears that, that this could escalate in this country too, as it is around the world. Well, Stuart, with uh, brave voices such as your own, uh, I'm sure there'll be fierce resistance to that. Thank you very much for coming on to Spectator TV. Pleasure. Thank you. Now, one of the more remarkable speeches at last week's Tory party conference was made uh, by the Home Secretary, Swella Bravman, in which she talked about luxury beliefs, uh, which is a phrase, I believe, coined by Rob Henderson, the uh, American academic. Um, but it's also something that our next guest, Matt Goodwin, um, talks about. Matt has a new book called Values, Voice and Virtue. Uh, and Matt, you've written quite a lot about this subject. Uh, can you define for us, first of all, for anyone who hasn't um, heard the term before, what luxury beliefs are and why they represent an opportunity for the Tory party? Yeah, sure. Uh, luxury beliefs really refer to ideas or views which confer status on members of the elite, which bring members of the elite few costs, but which impose very heavy costs on other people. So an example of a luxury belief might be uh, members of the political media cultural class calling for large-scale immigration because they're the least likely to suffer the negative effects of that. But we know from research, working class, non-graduate voters are the most likely to suffer the effects of that or similarly calling for a more relaxed approach to family, whereas we know members of the the elite are the most likely to get married, stay married and have children within marriage. It's everybody else that suffers from the collapse of, of those guardrails. So luxury belief is luxury beliefs are really about the sort of hypocrisy that lie at the, the heart of uh, some people in the elite. And for the Conservative Party, when it comes to issues like migration, diversity, identity, family, crime, uh, some prominent uh, uh, politicians, Swella Braverman included, clearly think that there's some political capital to be had by zooming in on some of those contradictions. Do you think perhaps there isn't as much political capital as perhaps Swella Braverman thinks? Because we've just had the Labour Party conference, and uh, I think it's quite clear that Keir Starmer is, is playing down that sort of politics. Uh, he's trying not to talk, even if these issues are salient he's not talking about them or he's dismissing them as populism without getting too stuck in them i i think there's another view which is you know labor are playing a very risky game when it comes to these these issues because you know look since the the brexit referendum we were often told that that voters don't really care about these these issues around immigration and identity anymore well we know that that's not true uh, we know that for example, migration, both legal and illegal, is back to being the third most important issue for all voters and the most important issue for those 2019 Conservative voters who only last week rated it above the economy, which is really quite remarkable when you consider we're in the most severe cost of living crisis for half a century. And even still, many of those voters who, of course, left Labour for Boris Johnson are saying that for them, immigration is is still a paramount issue. So for Labour and Keir Starmer to downplay that issue, to essentially not talk about it during the Labour conference, there's a little bit of discussion about, you know, smashing the gangs, but there wasn't really a sort of serious 
discussion about either how to bring down legal migration or how to actually um, prevent illegal migration over the longer term, um, I would argue that's a very risky political strategy for Labour and leaves the Conservatives, you know, with a big opening if they can if they can find a way to to kick a football into it. Um, and what about? I mean, obviously, migration is a huge one, and as you point out, there is there is some capital there for the Tories politically. Um, but on other issues, do you think it's fair to say that the the slur of populism is more uh, effective than it is perhaps in America? Because we often hear said, and it's it's not just an elite opinion. Uh, we often hear said that Brits Brits don't particularly like these issues coming into politics. They don't like you know woke issues. They don't like transgenderism as a political subject. It turns them off uh, in both directions, left and right. I you know I don't find that particularly convincing. I mean, if you look at the issues that we often refer to as as quote unquote culture wars. These issues are often actually very central to the way in which people think about their lives. Immigration is a great example. About 75% of people would like to lower overall migration. They think it's been too high over the last decade. Uh, They think it's been badly managed. If you look, for example, at gender issues, well, in Scotland, when people began to look at the Gender Recognition Reform Bill, they became really interested in it. And of course, 80% said this is a terrible idea. If you look at issues like crime, uh, the British public are consistently more hardline than both uh, Labour and Conservative politicians. And if you look at issues like political correctness or, or you know, woke ideology, um, you know, that again is, is something that concerns about 60% of Brits who say they feel in today's climate they can't really say what they want to, to say. So I, I don't buy the argument that uh, you know, so-called culture wars, which, by the way, you know, these issues are often foundational to to who we are, the rights of family, the rights of women, sex-based rights, history, identity. You know, this is all pretty central stuff. Uh, I, I don't think you can just push this out of politics. I think this is now in the centre of politics and in the public square. And so that's why we saw Rishi Sunak in Manchester make explicit reference to these issues in his speech. Now, a critic would say... He was also rather vague about what he wanted to do. You know, he said a woman is a woman, a man is a man. What does that mean the Conservatives are going to do what the Republicans have done in terms of intervening in schools and universities? And, and, you know, Suella Braverman, what she said, and I've polled it, is very popular in the country. 66% of all Brits think that mass immigration is an existential challenge to the West. But what are the actual policies that the Conservatives are going to introduce? Are they going to reduce legal migration? Are they going to increase the salary thresholds? that are currently allowing, I would argue, um, too much low school migration? Are they going to clamp down on international students and their dependents in a more long term, sustainable way? You know, these are all things that we don't really have the answers to. So it's difficult for the Conservatives to outflank Labour on migration because they they haven't really gone all in when it comes to delivering a policy that would act actually meet Uh, a majority of British voters where they are. So it makes it very difficult for the Conservatives. There is an opportunity, but they have to bring the policies forward to seize it. You were quite uh, caustic about the term culture wars there, and I I get what you mean. But isn't that precisely what you're getting at there, that for a lot of voters, uh, if it's just talk, if it's just uh, headlines and the odd statement um, by the Tories about stopping the boats or uh, pro-family or whatever, um, if, if there aren't any serious pro-family policies put in place, um, then voters don't really care either way what either party's saying. Voters are very disillusioned across the board. I recently polled um, uh, a big nationally representative sample of voters and I asked them, what are the issues that you feel really concerned about, but also feel you're not represented on? Number one was immigration. Most people want it lowered. Most people want it slowed down. Neither of the parties are committed to that. Number two was political correctness, people feeling like they cannot say what they think. Neither party is seriously committed to rooting out uh, this sort of stifling, um, you know, progressive ideology, so-called progressive ideology in the institutions, which has left so many people feeling as though they can't really say what they they want, want, want to say. And the third was promoting Britain's distinctive identity, history and culture 
against what many people feel as a sort of bland globalization, universal liberal ideology that sort of celebrates diversity, but isn't really all that interested in the distinctive things about Britain, the things that make us British or English or Welsh or Scottish. And and those are the things that people really do feel animated about. And all politics is about supply and demand. And I think in Britain, what we've got at the moment is actually lots of public demand for a different kind of politics, but we don't have much supply. We don't have either Labour or the Conservative Party really meeting voters on those on those issues. And so this big consensus that we have, a kind of big state, uh, high tax, uh, kind of uh, low productivity, high immigration, um, you know, London centric economy still it, it is alienating a lot of voters. They do want to talk about these issues. They do want to talk about what their kids are being taught around sex, gender and race. They do want to talk about the constant revision of British history. They do care about these things, about their shared identity. They also care about the cost of living. They also care about housing. But I simply don't buy the argument that these are fringe issues which politicians shouldn't talk about. Because if you want to see one politician, and you know this much better than me, Fred, if you want to see one politician who's riding high in the polls still and who's talking a lot about this, where well, you look at America and you can see with the Republicans and the current polling that they are still actually holding together the post-2016 realignment. If you look at how strongly supported working class voters are of um, uh, Donald Trump, non-graduates, pensioners, uh, small towners, suburban women, all the groups, by the way, that the British Tories have managed to alienate and lose over the last uh, few years, certainly since 2019, the Republicans are actually in play. I mean, they've still got that realignment. And irrespective of how you feel about Donald Trump, as a, as a case study of how to hold together a coalition, and by the way, they've also eaten into Hispanic Latino voters in a significant way, you know, they've done that partly by leaning into many of these cultural questions, by actually recognizing that voters want to have a conversation about the things that make them who, they're, who they are, their history, their identity, their culture, what we teach our children. Uh, now, whether the British Tories decide to step into that, not, not necessarily saying they should become a, a Trumpian party, but if they become a more interventionist party on these issues, a more culturally conservative party that's willing to actually have a conversation with the country about these issues, then I suspect they will have a lot more room for manoeuvre um, in at the elections to come. I suppose it's quite a difficult thing to prove, uh, but it seems to me from, a, from an observational point of view that uh, the more popular these issues become with the public, the more uh, the progressive ruling class uh, who hold these luxury opinions um, harden in their views. And I think we see that within the Conservative Party of it's not that the Conservatives disagree necessarily, it's just that they associate it with a sort of politics they find ugly, and probably in a snobbish sense, because this is, to a large extent, a class division. Yeah, well, I think that's spot on. I think if you, you know, why is it that the British Tories, unlike Conservatives in Italy, Sweden, France and America have actually been very reluctant to get involved. It doesn't take you long in the Tory movement to find somebody who's critical of Suella Braverman. I mean, what she's come out and said has actually been quite unpopular around the cabinet table. Why is that? Because they're status conscious Tories. I mean, they are they view cultural issues as being beneath them. Uh, they view issues around migration and, and integration and, and sex and gender and history and statues, you know, all this stuff is kind of, you know, lowbrow. It's not status driven politics. And that's where they're missing a trick. I mean, that's where they are really struggling. And if you look at the 2019 electorate that rallied around Boris Johnson, you know, wanting lower migration, stronger borders, tough approach on crime, promoting Britain's distinctive identity and history, which, you know, we've seen over the last three and four years be consistently eroded by the advance of, of radical progressivism. Uh, the Conservatives are only holding about 60% of that vote now. So, you know, that 40% has basically left the party. A big chunk's gone to Labour, a big chunk's gone to reform, um, but a bigger chunk has said, you know, I'm not going to vote at the next election. I'm completely disillusioned. And so what I often say to cabinet ministers, and I said to one last week, is, you know, we are now in a world where voters basically want security. They And they don't just want economic security from the cost of living crisis, from the uh, from the declining living standards. They don't just want physical security from a collapsing national health service. They don't just want um, national security from small boats, from rising immigration, from culturally 
different groups who we've seen this week protesting and supporting the atrocities in, in Israel on the streets of London, they also want cultural security. They want a, a cultural security from this oppressive, stifling orthodoxy, which has left them feeling as though, well, if they don't agree with radical progressives on on pro-immigration, pro-globalization, pro-social liberalism, they're going to be outcast. You know, they might lose their jobs or they might be silenced. And I think this cultural security notion is one that's going to become increasingly central to our politics, especially given the fact that 85 to 90 percent of voters in Britain really do feel very strongly attached to Britain. They feel proud of the country. They um, they view their national identity as a key part of who they are. That's not like the people who dominate many of the institutions. They, it's not to say they don't like Britain, but they don't attach as much importance to their national identity. So this rift is going to become still, I think, much more central to our politics as we navigate the 2020s and beyond. Uh, lastly, Matt, uh, just as a matter of curiosity, have you in all of your polling picked up a strong desire uh, in among the British public to ban smoking for young people? Um, not consistently. I mean, I've not polled it um, extensively myself and I've not, not focus grouped it. But if you look at some of the polling that we have had since the ban, um, YouGov, uh, I think I'm right in saying fine that a plurality is supportive of the ban, um, a minority oppose it. Um, but uh, I've not done any uh, detailed work on it. But probably fair to say it's not a priority for British voters. Oh, it's it's no, it's not a priority at all. And actually, one of the things I wrote about in uh, on on my Substack was about um, you know Sunak's speech was bizarre for that reason. Which is, if you look at the top three issues for all voters in the country, number one is cost of living, number two is NHS, and number three is migration. And migration is both legal and illegal. Um, and the problem is, you know, he decided to focus on the smoking ban. A levels and a train line into Northern England. And these are just not salient issues for the country. And I wonder why he went so far off the grid in his conference speech. And when you compare and contrast that to Keir Starmer's, I have to say, even though Starmer played down immigration, which I mentioned was risky, he did at least talk a lot about the salient issues, about the cost of living crisis, about the state of the NHS, about housing, about some of these really big totemic issues. And I think Sunak, you know, I understand the strategy of being more combative, but he's got to get back to those top three issues very quickly. It's probably status driven. Um, Matt, thank you very much indeed. Uh, everyone should read your new book, uh, Values, Voice and Virtue. Uh, and please come on Spectator TV again soon. As just mentioned, the government has banned smoking for young people. It will be a phased ban, but it's a ban nonetheless. Uh, but a very interesting article on Spectator Life this week asked the question, is social media worse for teenagers than smoking? Uh, Cara Usher-Smith, who is the director of the Centre for Social Justice, uh, wrote that piece. Uh, she joins us now, along with Mary Wakefield, our commissioning editor. Uh, Cara, I'll start with you. Um, you think that the government should be as serious about banning social media as it is about stopping smoking? Yes, I do. Um, I think that parents are currently between a rock and a hard place. So if you don't give your child a smartphone with access to social media, um, you're risking, you know, when they're older, you're risking them getting bullied, you're risking serious social isolation and, you know, an inability to form friendships, which they're all doing through their phones. So a parent's weighing up that with saying, OK, but then there's also the mental health issues that they could get from giving them the smartphone, um, which is why I think the government needs to step in here. And um, I think we need two things. I think we need a legislative change um, brought about, where which basically doesn't allow um, anybody under 16 to have access to social media. And I'm sure greater minds than mine would be able to work out the best way to do that. Um, but I also think we need to have a shift in the whole culture of this country so that it becomes, you know, shocking to see a young child with a smartphone or a young teenager. Um, you know, as said in the article, as shocking as seeing a 10-year-old making a roly or drinking a bottle of vodka. Yes. 
You point in your piece towards this, is it Sapien Labs? Yes. Sapien Labs study that you told me just before we started recording came out in May. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do, that suggested that the impact on young girls is much worse yes. than on young boys. What, yes. What, why do you think that is? It is. I think that girls are really lacking in confidence at, um, in their young teenage years. They're more concerned with what they look like broadly than guys. And I think they can feel, for whatever reasons, more socially insecure. Mm. Um, and I think the way that the videos, the videos on TikTok, the videos on Instagram are set up, they are just bringing out the worst aspects of teenage girls. You know, they really are focused on the most superficial side um, of, of, of girls. It's all about dancing and diet tips and makeup. There's no videos that I saw um, which were about what books these children are into or what issues inspire them it was yes um and you think tiktok and snapchat and all the mm. apps that are most popular with the young people are the are the worst ones yes exactly and there's a particularly awful feature on snapchat which um, my goddaughter told me about which is where you connect with somebody and then um they all are tracking each other's live lo live mm. locations so my goddaughter was sitting on the sofa with us as a family and she saw all her friends going off to a party in Norfolk that she hadn't been invited to. Mm. Then she sees all her friends going over to someone else's house. I mean, it's just designed to send young I know, teenagers so, I know crazy. a few young people who follow their exes obsessively. So you never have an ex anymore if you're on Snapchat. <laughs> Mm. because um, if they've ditched you, yeah. you're very invested in finding out where they are, what they're doing. And they just, through the night, they don't sleep. They're following these exes, ex-girlfriends, ex-boyfriends, to see where they're going, whose houses they're going into. Oh, it's hell, fun. isn't it? Very, you and I have talked about the point that we are both tremendous hypocrites as parents. We are, but that's the point because of being a parent. Are, it's an are, opportunity to be on, a hypocrite. I need to establish for, for the viewers why we're hypocrites, because yeah. we are horrendously addicted to our I phones. think you're a little worse than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you may be right. Yeah. Uh, but of course, it's very hard for us to then set an example to our children because they see us on our phones all the time and they associate that with being grown up. They think it's a, a grown up thing to do is to yeah. stare at the screen all day. Yeah. Do you have that thing where you suddenly catch a, a glimpse of what you must look like as a family on a Saturday yes, afternoon yes. or something and then everyone's on a different device and you feel, you know, sad, but then you don't stop it. So, yes. Yeah, no, we are addicts mm. and it's very hard for kids to... Um, I'm definitely an addict. Kids, yeah, I'm an addict. Who, <laughs> who is it? Who is, but we also know, Freddie, we've also discussed how terrible it's terrible for our brains. Mm. You know, you find yourself just scrolling sideways all the time and not developing consecutive thoughts as easily, mm. not reading novels. Yeah. So we know how bad it is for our kids. Uh, and it must be worse for more impressionable, more plastic Yeah, our minds. brains are pretty much dead, so... Of course. But, you're, Mary, you have some doubts, I think, about it being particularly worse for girls than it is for boys. You, I just don't know. I mean... You know, I think sort of statistically or psychologically, women um, react to sort of stress differently. So female prisoners will mm. self-harm and mm. male prisoners will punch someone else. We've looked at what we've asked kids is um, how anxious and depressed are you? And the girls have said very, like 70% mm. of Gen mm. Z yes. are anxious or something. And as a result of smartphone use, we think. But maybe we're not asking the boys the right question. I just don't think anyone's studied the effect it's having on boys, which may be different. Mm. That's my only point there. I mean, I think, I'm sure that's true as well. I think that boys are just on social media a bit less. Yeah, is that um, right? Then, yeah, I think so, than the girls. And I mean, I think for boys, there's obviously gaming's a massive issue as boys get older. Is that a problem, gaming? Well, I mean, so anecdotally, purely anecdotally, I, I've seen that as, a, a yes, a big problem. Um, and, um, you know, I think boys really do get swept up into this um, cyber world yeah. um, and can get very addicted to it. And then, of course, there's also pornography, which is an issue that is affecting boys. But um, well, the, yeah. the government yeah. is doing something about pornography and bullying. I was trying to through the online arms bill. Uh, but what you're saying is that mm. the government should be Funny. more uh, draconian about it, it should say. Uh, yes. No social media accounts for anyone the age of 16. Yes, because I think that what the politicians are doing, they're focusing on um, smartphones in schools, which is quite right. And I thought the announcement by Gillian Keegan was brilliant. Um, but what they're, and then in the online, ha online harms bill, they're focusing on, you know, viewing harmful content. But what they're not doing, as far as I can see, is talking about the mental health issues from social media. Mm. It's just, I mean, Miriam, Kate talks about it, but beyond that, it doesn't seem to be much of a... Cora, why is it issue? government's yeah. job? Yeah. I mean, 
Yeah. I, I, you know, <laughs> was uh, lucky enough to talk to Dr. Jean Twenge, who's the author yes. of Generations, a bit of a plug for her there. Um, and she is extremely impressive, very grown up. I don't think uses her smartphone too much. And she said, mm. she has just told her teenage daughters they don't have one. And I said, are they okay with that? Mm -hmm. And she, um, she looked quite fierce and said, yes, absolutely. They're fine. They've got text. So they mm. arranged to meet up with their friends, but they don't have any of the apps. They have what, you know, the, the, the sort of dumb phones, as mm. it were. Why isn't it a parent's job? Shouldn't we all be more gene twinge and just say, no, kids? So I have a lot I have a lot of sympathy to the nanny state argument but I think when it comes to children it's this point that the children don't really stand a chance and I think parents find it so overwhelming back to this dichotomy of yeah. they've got you know there's so much against them if they don't have a phone but they that, could have yeah. the phone with just the texts on it yes and they're not going to be able to pay for it themselves so you really do have quite a lot of control here you yes. can just say I'm sorry darling you know blame me well, I think there are, there yeah. are a lot of uh, good parents would try to do that. A lot of good parents would fail to do that, I think. But then there are a lot of parents who just simply won't bother to do that. So I suppose, Cara, your argument mm, is yeah. that the, there is, there's no stopping children having smartphones yes, and unless I... you, and to access to social media accounts unless you do it at the yes. level. Yes. Well, the government I... just says you, you, kids are not allowed smartphones. Well, well, well no, I think no, they should be allowed. Account. I think they can right. have smartphones but not have access to social media. I don't know, yeah. maybe they do it through like some proper age verification process or yeah. something like that. But I think the point is that these apps are addictive. Yes. And I kind of think in the same way we don't allow access, you know, to children of addictive drugs, we're protecting children. I think they should be protected from the addictive nature of these apps which have been designed by, you know, the best Harvard PhD minds um, in the amount Suck of funding, out. the billions that's gone into the funding on this. Mm. Um, I think our our children need to, a bit of protection from it. Uh, lastly, you're both mothers. What are your policies with your own children? Uh, I'll start with you, Cara. Um, well, at the moment, they, they don't have smartphones at all. But I think I'm sure by the time they're 14, I, I'll probably cave because I think the social pressure on them is huge and I would worry about them getting bullied but I'd love to think I would be a bit stronger than that. Mine is to look at my phone and keep the kid at arm's length and say don't talk to me I'm on my phone that's my. But Kelly is, is six, he's only seven. He's seven. Oh. Um, yeah I, I think I'm not going to let him have one but you'll have to um, get back to me on that. My eldest is 12 and we've held out so far yeah. but we shall see. Good luck Freddie. Uh, the pressure is definitely coming. Yeah. Uh, Cara and Mary thank you very much for coming on Spectator TV. That's it for this week, a rather sombre show uh, for obvious reasons, uh, but I hope you found it useful and informative. Um, I should also, before we go, thank our brilliant sponsors, Can Accord Genuity Wealth Management once more. Visit CanDoWealth.com to find out more information about them. And do tune in again next week.